This is IAQ Radio, Indoor Air Quality Radio, the voice of the indoor air quality industry, with your host, Radio Joe Hughes, and the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick. And now, Radio Joe Hughes. Good day and welcome to IAQ Radio Plus. It's episode 649, and we've got a great show today on the life and times of an IAQ legend, Terry Brennan. Looking forward to a great show with Terry. Uh, Before we get started, let's thank our sponsors. They're the reason we can continue doing the show, and don't forget, we continue the discussion on afterthoughts.iaqradio.com after the show, sponsored by First On Site. Our marquee sponsor is Instascope at instascope.co. Our association sponsors are the American Industrial Hygiene Association, AIHA.org, the American Conference of Governmental Industrial Hygienists, ACGIH.org, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute, CIRIScience.org, the Indoor Air Quality Association, IAQA.org, the Restoration Industry Association, restorationindustry.org. The Institute for Inspection, Cleaning, and Restoration Certification, iicrc.org. Healthy Buildings America 2021, hb2021-america.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories, aemlinc.com. Particles Plus, particlesplus.com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, graywolfsensing.com. TSI Inc., TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals, sunbeltrentals.com. April Air, April, A-I-R-E.com. Healthy Indoors Magazine, healthyindoors.com. And now you can win a cool prize. It's time for the IAQ Radio Trivia Question. Be the first to correctly answer. Simply email your answer to czlotnick at cs.com. Or if listening live, just text your answer from your computer. And now, here's the Z-Man. Hello, everyone. Congratulations go out that they're the knee of Clark Safe Clark Engineering in Chandler, Arizona who was first to identify composite sampling as the sampling method with according to US EPA 2014A colon USA EPA 2016 sampling method where several methods, where several samples are physically mixed together into a larger sample. The IQ radio trivia question for today, December 17, 2021, has been sponsored by TSI, an industry leader in precision instrumentation for the monitoring of indoor air. Learn how to expand your IEQ investigations at TSI.com. Here's today's IEQ trivia question. In 1993, the New York City Department of Health and Mental Hygiene first issued recommendations on addressing mold growth indoors. Who was the editor of that document? Back to you, Joe. Interesting, Cliff. I don't know off the top of my head. Anyway, Terry Brennan is a building scientist and educator. He studied buildings since the 1970s. Because of his background in physics, biology, and building construction, Mr. Brennan combines theory and practice in a unique and integrated way. He was the president and senior building scientist at Cam Rodden Associates, Inc. in Westmoreland, New York, from its founding in 1984 until 2019 when he uh, started a well-deserved uh, retirement, I guess we'd call it. Terry, welcome back to the show. Always great to have you. Thanks, Joe. Are you officially retired then, or is this just uh, kind of a I, temporary thing? I'm, I'm mostly retired. <laughs> Occasionally <laughs> do, do some work for a friend or a neighbor or... And I hear your your honey to do list has grown significantly uh, since your retirement. <laughs> uh, most of my time is spent with my family these days, Joe. So uh, we and we're always busy. Good, 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 good. All right, hey Terry, let's let's get started with you know you went from. You were a physics major at what Northeastern, I believe it was. Um, you got your master's in, I think it was environmental science or, or something along those lines. Um, yeah. How did you go from that to being a, an IAQ legend? 
<laughs> uh, well, like most things in my life, accidentally. Uh, okay. I, I, um, uh, it, it really started, I, I, I think, in the, uh, during the oil embargoes of the 1970s, when we got really interested in uh, how low can we get the energy use in a building. And part of that was making things as airtight as possible. And it turns out it was pretty easy to make things four or five times tighter than they were typically made. Um, and the, the, that, that becomes a learning experience when you <laughs> make, uh -huh. make a, a house four or five times more airtight. The, the one indoor air, um, component that always goes up is uh, humidity. So we experienced moisture problems in those early buildings that we did. Um, and because I had the science training, uh, I, I, I could make measurements and figure stuff out. So uh, that's kind of how it began for me. Um, and in graduate school, uh, Antioch in New England in environmental studies, I did some uh, independent studies at Total Environmental Action, which was an architectural firm started by Bruce Anderson up there near the, the college. Um, and I, they had a series of lectures and Jeremy Coleman, uh, who I learned a lot from, who was the builder, came and gave a talk about um, uh, ventilation and indoor air contaminants and that somehow that just grabbed me so <laughs> I, I was, was all primed for that and I started making measurements about of contaminants and ventilation rates and trying to figure this stuff out one thing led to another and here I am retired and on your show <laughs> oh. There, uh, that's, you're talking the 70s and then in 84 you started Cam Rodden um, and you've, that's basically been your, your career is, is, um, helping people with building science issues and with, uh, building problems, I guess you would say, I'm, I'm curious in the early days, you mentioned that when we were tightening up homes, moisture went up. Um, another thing I know you looked at in the early days was radon and did the same thing happen with radon when we tightened up buildings? Um, I would say, well, if you if you plotted uh, radon concentrations versus air exchange rates it, you, for over a, a big number of buildings, you don't see much of a correlation there. It doesn't make a line of any kind. Um, and but that's because the source term is so much more important. And the, the, the ra radon helped me to understand how air moves through buildings in crazy ways that no one planned it to do. Um, because that turned out, it turned out that radon getting into buildings was being carried in by air flows from the surrounding soil. So it was outdoor air being drawn through the soil, picking up the radon as it came through and into the building. And it, if you have a, a, bit, a high soil concentration, that that's going to be the determining factor about rather than the ventilation rate. So, so the, 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 that's the long answer. The long answer is uh, across the population of buildings, it's not, it doesn't make much difference for a single building. It would make a difference. Um, I, I'll give you an example of how it makes a difference for a single building. Back, uh, back in the early nineties, we, we, uh, as part of an EPA project, Bill Turner and I um, uh, and Richard Shaughnessy went to a number of public schools across the country to study radon and, and uh, also we, we did uh, P PM, uh, PM10 measurements and VOCs and um, bioaerosols measurements in, in classrooms. But in, in Maine, we had a, a couple of schools where the, the ventilation system was all exhaust ventilation. There was no fan powered outdoor air. So, mm -hmm. so we knew that, and, and the, a lot of that ventilation had been disabled. 
So they, they were low ventilation rate compared to what they were designed to be. And uh, we got, we fixed all that equipment so that the exhaust ventilation was back to where it was about 10 CFM a person back in uh, when it was designed. And we were worried that the radon concentration would actually um, increase because we were depressurizing Mm -hmm. uh, but it, it, it went down in both those schools uh, by something like a factor of seven. Hmm. And, and, and the, so exhaust ventilation, depressurizing the building, the radon concentration went down, but it didn't go down as much as you would have expected it to by dilution. So we knew we did draw in some additional soil air, but it, we drew, drew in a lot more air from above grade. So we were diluting it with that, but it wasn't as much as it would have been if we were blowing the ventilating air into the building. <laughs> so that, that for me, that, that tells me for a particular building, the ventilation rate and the way in which the ventilation is uh, provided uh, can have a, a big impact on radon concentrations. I think that goes to the theme of a lot of what you talk about, Terry, and that that, that is it's, it's hard to generalize what uh, indoor air quality in buildings, you know, how indoor air quality in buildings is going to be affected. You've got to go out and look at the actual building itself and, and, and figure out what particular things, including the occupants of the buildings, um, how they're actually affecting the indoor air quality. Yeah, to, to, to quote, to quote uh, Joe Steverick, uh, the, the answer to most building related questions is it depends. <laughs> <laughs> and it does. Hey, John, put that picture back up. I think this was the early Terry Brennan days. Uh, you were, we were talking about you're in a school here, Terry. Maybe you could tell people a little. This started out as radon and then moved into more. Uh, yeah, the, it, it, initially it was uh, the EPA wanted to do some interventions in um, uh, public schools that had elevated radon. And uh, we quickly decided that um, what, as long as we were in there, it would be relatively inexpensive to add in, make it a broader study than ventilation and uh, radon. And that's when we got Richard Shaughnessy involved and, uh, and we already had Bill Turner involved. Um, so we had two really high caliber uh, indoor air quality folks involved in that and made the, uh, the, the laser particle counters and uh, also the Harvard uh, PM10 uh, gravimetric um, measurements. And we made, uh, not only total VOC, but we speciated the, um, the VOCs that we, we collected. And we also speciated the, uh, the bioaerosols. We, um, uh, Estelle Leventon at uh, uh, Tulsa did the uh, bioaerosols uh, uh, analysis for us back then. So that, that and <laughs> what I'm doing here is uh, when you're in a, a, a building like uh, a school building, you're, you're going to have to have big air handlers for the ventilation. Uh, the, I'm inside an air handler here on the viewers left are the outdoor air dampers for the uh, air handling unit. And on the viewers right, you can see a yellowish green pleated filter. Uh, that's filtering the out incoming outdoor air. And I, I discovered that in, in a unit like this, it's pretty hard to get a pitot tube traverse anywhere because you just don't have the, the, the you have, just have too many eddy currents. Uh, um, so I, I took the flow sensing element off the, uh, the, um, the bolometer and I, I used it to do traverses across the filter. And, and the filter tends to even out the flows and um, make the air going through right there pretty laminar. 
So I got pretty good uh, measurements from doing that. And we compared it to actually to doing pitot tube traverses in a couple of cases, we were able to do that. So we knew we were getting good data using that. But when you're doing field work, you, you kind of have to develop your own methods of getting the data that you need. Be, <laughs> improvise and prevail, I guess would be the, the, the way to think about it. John, let's go to the next. I think we have one more photo. Yeah, the one with the uh, on the. There we go. There's another interesting project, Terry. Maybe you could. It's kind of similar, but uh, a little bit different uh, approach, I guess. Well, yeah. In this case, we're we're doing the same thing. We're measuring the outdoor air flow into a building. This happens to be a a, a large warehouse uh, outside of Toronto. Um, and this is when we were beginning to um, get serious about doing pressure, uh, pressure flow measurements of um, big buildings, uh, essentially blow or door test on large buildings. Um, we, we did it when in the early 90s there with the school studies. And then this is probably 2005 or so. Um, and we're using the air handlers to pressurize the building and we, we need to get good flow measurements. So we built uh, a, an outdoor air intake duct and attached it to the outdoor air intake on the rooftop unit and did a pitot tube traverse. Well, you know, multiple stations with the pitot tube so we could get pretty, pretty accurate measurements of the flows and measure the, at the same time, the change in the indoor outdoor pressure differences. So that, that's, uh, and we piece that together with lawn furniture, PVC pipe and poly. And uh, probably that looks like 3M red tape back from those days. <laughs> and not long, this is uh, around the time of this book right here, Building Air Quality. Uh, I still have it on the shelf, Terry. It's one of my favorites. And uh, it's a Thank great you. document, a guide for building owners and facility managers. And what made me think of that was when you when you talk about pressure mapping, that was a big part of the discussion in this document. Can you tell us, is that the reason why when, you know, you're out there doing work in these buildings and commercial and school buildings and, and realizing how important mesh, mapping pressure differentials was? Yeah, the, it, it turned out that when I started looking over my case records back in the middle 90s, I started looking over my case records. And, and also, we had back then, we had work from uh, Joe Stebrick and from uh, John Tooley and Neil Moyer about uh, how crazy airflows in buildings, uh, airflows no one anticipated, um, were causing moisture and indoor air quality and thermal comfort problems. Uh, so, and uh, Joe, Joe and my associate, Mike Clark and I wrote uh, two papers um, for the ASHRAE Healthy Buildings Conference back in 96 or 98 uh, that were called the Unintended Consequences of Planned and Unplanned Airflows in um, commercial buildings. And then we did another uh, second one for just for residential buildings to bring this idea out into the, the, the field of uh, building science and indoor air quality. Uh, uh, so yeah, how crazy air flows, that's, uh, <laughs> that's, that turned out to be at the heart of probably 50% of the cases I ever had. And the other thing that turned out to be very important in the cases I had was moisture problems. That if I, which, which led me to the, if you wanna have a healthy building, keep it dry, clean and pest free. And, and those are the, the first three important steps to take. If that was, if buildings were kept dry, clean and pest free, something like 80% of my caseload would have disappeared. <laughs> And we would have been out of business long ago, huh? Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, you know, but that leads me to another um, contribution you've made over the years. Uh, you did some work with the National Center for Healthy Housing, and they now have the eight principles of healthy housing. And you just hit on the three most important, dry, clean, pest-free. 
Uh, they added contaminant free, safe, uh, ventilated and um, thermally controlled some others. Uh, were you a part of that document or that that work? Uh, yeah, that, I, I, I was. They, the, um, the, that this goes back to actually the uh, R Richard Shaughnessy again got got me involved with the uh, Tulsa Lung Association back around around 1990 I think it was and at at that point we the, it, I sat down and thought about this as systematically as I could and reviewed all the literature um, and and I I came up with. Uh, keep the building dry, clean, and pest-free, reduce potential contaminant sources, provide exhaust ventilation for unavoidable stationary sources, provide dilution ventilation for unavoidable mobile or large area sources, like, like you can't put an ex exhaust hood over the kids, you know, <laughs> it's, yep. it's a mobile sources, and you can't put an exhaust hood over uh, the carpet, so... So for big, large area sources, you can't. And then reduce unplanned airflows. That, that was my first stab at it. And then but probably most of everything I know I learned from people who came to hear me speak. Um, Interesting. So, <laughs> uh, when, when, uh, when I was teaching some of these classes back then uh, for... Um, uh, the National Center for one of the lung associations. Uh, one of the one of the old guys in the class said, "You know, uh, you ought to get, include people in this list because they <laughs> they're uh, they're big sources of contaminants and uh, and they do stupid things in houses and buildings all the time." And so uh, I added, "Understand and educate people" is the first item I thought. I was convinced by his uh, his comment, and I, I immediately had many examples from my experience of people doing amazingly silly things in buildings uh, and causing problems. And so I thought, yeah, that, that's important. If if people aren't aware and they don't understand, they're going to continue to do silly things. And that this led to Brennan's first law of uh, occupant behavior, uh, which, which is um, I. There's no solution that I, I can uh, implement in a building that's so well thought through um, or so cleverly installed that it can't be overcome by a determined or simply unlucky occupant. <laughs> Ain't that the truth, huh? I'll tell you what, Terry, what, this might be a good spot, John, to throw the, the slides of some of the things Terry's seen over the years. Um, maybe first... The, the photo of uh, that quizzical look on his, on his, uh... there he goes. <laughs> yeah. that, 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 at some point in every case, I look like this. <laughs> I'm like, what the heck is going <laughs> What? And we're going to show you some photos that give it, gave him that look. Go ahead, John. Walk that, us that, through this one, Terry. <laughs> this one is uh, start. Uh, the quote is from uh, Florence Hollis's uh, textbook on, uh, um, social casework, uh, which I, I actually read when I was uh, a, a senior child care worker at a group home for emotionally disturbed uh, adolescent boys, hmm. which, which really did actually prepare me for a career in, in uh, building science. <laughs> <laughs> Some of those same guys are running buildings today. <laughs> yeah, yeah, well, so, so what, what Florence stressed was that if you want to make any progress with someone who's got emotional problems, you have to uh, start where they are. <laughs> and, All right. and build, buildings and the people in buildings are the same way. Uh, start out understanding what's going on with the people and what their desires and needs are. And you got a much better chance of solving the problem and having it remain solved. All right, next, John. Um, th this is uh, a photograph <laughs> of uh, a, a, a woman who is allergic to cats. Oh, beautiful! And, and <laughs> <laughs> I, I put this in because 
we 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 make decisions uh, based on what, what what our desires are more much more than we do on logic, um, and, and we lay a veneer of logic over our emotional decisions. Uh, um, Sig Sigmund Freud, the Sigmund Freud quote I have that goes with this is, um, "Intellect is a fly speck on the sea of emotion." Yep, yep, that's a beauty. <laughs> Go to the next uh, one, John. That, that's how we are in building. <laughs> this, this is in a, this is in a, an office building, and the, the, this is a, 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 a ther thermostat on the wall, and it's not a thermostat with a, a, a little lever on it and and numbers that tell you what the temperature is or a thermometer. It's just a sensor that goes back to a. a a digital control system someplace out in the building. And the, the people in this office were not getting enough air conditioning. They wanted it to be cooler. So they permanently installed a, a swinging lamp on, a, <laughs> on an arm that they could swing over, turn the light on, they could swing it over against the thermostat, heat the thermostat off and get more air conditioning. <laughs> Oh um, my! Uh, amazing. <laughs> People find the greatest workarounds. <laughs> so you know when you see something like that in a building, it's it just it, it's a flag. It lets you know there's something that's really not working right with this uh, with this air conditioning system, either in design or in installation or in operation and maintenance. Something's gone wrong. It's not working well enough to to help out these people in, in this wing of the building. So, so anything that I do to try and solve whatever problems they're having has to take that into account or they're just going to figure out some way to get around it. <laughs> and they'll ignore everything else you say. <laughs> yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. <laughs> Let's go to the next one, John. Oh, I love uh, these. <laughs> this, is, uh, this is something that my, my old partner, Mike, and I called post-construction engineering, <laughs> 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 which is... These folks decided they put a storm door on their, their porch. And when they went to open the door, the top of the door hit the, uh, hit the header that held the roof up at the edge of the porch. And they, at, at which point someone said, Louise, get my chisel. <laughs> <laughs> I've been looking for something to use that chisel on. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, you know, it, people, they, they, they make changes like this. They just blow through buildings like wind, carving out the, the stone in the desert southwest. It's nice and tight, too. All right, let's go to the next one. What do we got here, Jerry? <laughs> well, uh, public schools are an unusual place, and, and kids kids themselves are, uh, you know, they're they're just so energetic and, uh, and actively using their brains to figure things out. Um, <laughs> one of one of my favorite uh, back actually when I was at graduate school, um, Jeremy Coleman, who I worked with sometimes, uh, we we put a, some solar collectors on a on a Waldorf school um, back there, and we thought, you know, if we put glass covers on solar collectors on the wall of a school, it's going to get broken. So we got polycarbonate, ribbed polycarbonate panels and put those on there. And those kids, they managed, they, it, it became, what would we have to do to break it? <laughs> and the rocks just got bigger. Eventually they, they found that they could take a pointed rock and they could drill a hole through it wow. <laughs> by, <laughs> by, by doing this. And that a rock they could barely lift, they could shatter it with. And we ended up, we replaced it with tempered glass and they, they never broke it. <laughs> and I think that's because they, everybody knows what happens when you hit glass with a rock. Yeah, it's, there's nothing, to, no excitement in that. <laughs> they're, they're, they're little scientists. They're figuring out what, you know, what are the material properties of polycarbonate? So... <laughs> Uh, that's good. And another thing I learned in public schools is don't bother putting any monitoring equipment in a science classroom. They can't keep their hands off it. 
Uh, wow. <laughs> They're always, it's all, the data is always messed up because they're fooling with it. So, <laughs> so hey, John, I, anyway, that's my, uh, we have to do this one before we break. <laughs> cool. I, I took this picture. This is like 20 feet in the air. And the kids had learned that the louvers are spaced just right. That if you hit it just right with a baseball or a tennis ball, the ball would get in there and get stuck. <laughs> Uh, the things you find in these schools. Terry, we're going to stop for a minute. We're going to thank our sponsors. We're going to come back with the second half of our show with the life and times of an IAQ legend, Terry Brennan. Our marquee sponsor, Instascope. More jobs done faster with the future of IAQ assessment technology. Unlimited samples, instant results, and cloud-based data at Instascope. Dot co. Our association sponsors are AIHA, Healthy Workplaces, A Healthier World, AIHA.org, ACGIH, Advancing Careers of Professionals in Environmental Health, Industrial Hygiene, and Safety, Interested in Defining Their Science, ACGIH.org, The Cleaning Industry Research Institute, See More Deeply Through Science and Research, CIRI science.org the indoor air quality association iaqa.org the restoration industry association the granddaddy of the restoration industry restorationindustry.org the iicrc a nonprofit standards development and certifying body for the cleaning and restoration industry iicrc.org healthy buildings america Honolulu, Hawaii, January 18 through 20, 2022. HB2021-America.org. Industry sponsors are AEML Laboratories. Free shipping, great pricing, same-day results with no rush fee. AEMLINC.com. Particles Plus. Feature-rich particle counters and air quality instrumentation. Count on us. Particles Plus. Dot com. Gray Wolf Sensing Solutions, over 20 years manufacturing accurate, reliable IAQ instrumentation for portable, short-term, and continuous monitoring. GrayWolfSensing.com. TSI Inc., an industry leader in precision instrumentation for monitoring indoor air. Learn how to expand your IAQ investigations. TSI.com. Sunbelt Rentals, availability, reliability, and ease. For all your IAQ and restoration needs at sunbeltrentals.com. April Air, healthy air, healthy home, April, A-I-R-E dot com. And Healthy Indoors Magazine, a free online magazine for industry professionals and consumers, healthyindoors.com. We're back for the second half of our interview with Terry Brennan. Uh, John, let's put up those last couple. Uh, I think we got two more slides to show on some of the uh, interesting things Terry has seen over the years. Go ahead, John. All right. There we go. Oh, here we go. Perfect, Terry. <laughs> <laughs> this is, uh, I'm, I'm still thinking about the things that people in the building can <clears throat> can clue you in on and uh the, the this is one this is in the custodial closet in uh, uh on the top floor of a uh, uh, city hall and a uh, a building up here in upstate new york <clears throat> and uh it, I, the, the the reason they had me in the building is because they were having uh complaints about diesel fumes and the <laughs> when, hmm. When you see a sign like this and you're, you're in snow country, that the reason that you would uh, leave the water running <laughs> is because the pipes will freeze if the water's not running. And if the pipes are freezing inside the building, that means that in, there's a pretty big air leak someplace that's blowing right across some pipes. So, so you, yep. you, you, you kind of know what the heck is going on. You're like, oh, okay, we're talking about unplanned air flows here in this building and <laughs> beautiful great clue let's yeah, go to the next one join clue. i i had another real inner oh <laughs> well that looking and seeing uh, my grandmother would some 
I can remember clearly this. Uh, she sent me down to the basement to get some uh, some uh, raspberry preserves that she had put up. And they were right there on the shelf, of course. But I went back up and said, I can't find them, Grandma. <laughs> <laughs> at, at which point she took me back down. And of course, they were right there. And that was my first lesson in looking and seeing are not the same thing. So <laughs> I was looking, but I wasn't seeing. Interesting. And so, so my wife would accuse me of that quite a bit too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, and I, and I, I, I suppose listening and hearing is the the corollary, huh? There you go. Yes, sir. <laughs> um, I put up that Bev Doolittle picture because it, it, you know, it's like how many horses are in this picture? <laughs> <laughs> Uh, and and how would you do you count legs or noses or how do you figure that out uh, or or is what you're seeing chocolate ice cream with marshmallow fluff, fluff on it? The oh, I just saw the horses, Terry. <laughs> it took me a minute. <laughs> huh? the same uh, okay, for the, the, I'm charmed by the sign that says the upper room with the arrow pointing down the stairs. <laughs> John, let's go to the next one, buddy. That looks interesting too. Oh, I love this. What well, these are the two two different dynamics and two different climates. On the the left, we have the uh, acrylic cover over the fire alarm pole on a cor an interior corridor wall on a public school in Florida, and. The complaint is that it smells like mold, but we can't find the mold. And the clue is the condensation on the poly on the acrylic cover is on the inside surface, not on the hall side surface. So I know that the nasty hot humid air is inside an interior demising wall, not an exterior wall. So I've got an air leak from out central florida outdoor hot humid air going into a demising wall for the corridor and condensing in there and that's where the mold is it's hidden in the wall so that, Interesting. that that's the the and no no measurements no contaminant measurements no pressure measurements all i had to do was look and see uh, wow. <laughs> on on the the right hand side this is a three-story walk-up apartment building in Syracuse, New York. And you can so you can see the snowflakes. This is, of course, Syracuse in June. And <laughs> I know that feeling. No, it's actually not. I, I was it could be Indian building. Lake in June. <laughs> <laughs> well, I was at this building with Henry Gifford, and, uh, and, and it was Henry's case. And he had already figured out uh, what the problem was, but the, the clue, the clue is that it's snowing out and the windows are open on the top two floors. <laughs> it's like something is not right with the heating system here. <laughs> yep. Yep. And the bottom floor, they're all closed. So what's the... They're all closed. So that's the, that's uh, the, uh, the illustration of the stack effect in uh, this building, which is all... Uh, this is uh, was uh, single pipe steam uh, heat and uh, no ventilation equipment whatsoever in the buildings. So, so uh, if you, with the top floor windows open because they're overheating, the the bottom of the building is under a lot of negative pressure and all that cold air is coming in. People had their windows all duct taped down there on the bottom floor. <laughs> wow. Talk about air air issues. Let's go to the next one here. Augment your senses. Okay. So the the the, the I, uh, a lot of times in a in a building, it's what you, the clue is not immediately visible when you look at the surfaces or when you talk to the people in the building. Um, and so I, I am increasing my ability to see things with equipment. So in this particular piece of equipment is a, a little uh, machinist microscope. So it has a, it comes with a crappy pen light or it used to, they, I think they may have improved that now, but I made a little LED light that hugely improved uh, how well you could see things with uh, that little hundred power scope. 
Um, mm. And it's reflected light, not transmitted light. So you put it right on the surface and you see the surface. The, uh, over on the right hand side, there, I've got a little theatrical fog generator that is very useful in tracking air flows. Which way is the air going and where does it come out? Um, and it, it's also very useful in convincing people to take an action. Uh, I learned that if I use a smoke bottle or if I use a, a, um, a, a tracer gas or if I do you know, advanced pressure diagnostics, people don't believe pressure diagnostics. They don't believe uh, um, tracer gas studies. They, they believe their eyes. And when, when the fog rolls out, somebody says, uh, Larry, get a cock gun. <laughs> <laughs> you know, they, they believe it and they, they, they make a change. So that, that's a, an important tool in, in my experience. And, and also along these lines, don't be afraid to make a hole. You, you can yeah. see I, I've, made, I've cut a piece of gypsum board out so I could look at the backside of the gypsum board with my little microscope. And what do I see? Now we have Next the slide taken through that same little microscope. Here, here we have exquisitely beautiful uh, aspergillus. Hmm. Nice. Let's go to the next one, John. Uh, this is uh, through the same microscope. But this is a, a case uh, where the local library was having their, um, their servers were failing at an alarming rate, you know, like one after the other. And, uh, and I had already had some cases uh, like this. So I had a good idea of what was going on over there. I said, zinc whiskers, this is uh, um, looking through the mic microscope at the bottom of the um, floor panels, the two foot by two foot floor panel panels in a computer room, a raised computer room floor. Mm -hmm. And the bottom of those uh, is a pan of uh, zinc coated steel. And <laughs> when, you, when I look at the bottom, what I see is zinc has, has be, become mobile and crystallized into these long thin whiskers. And if you disturb them, they end up in the air. And when they're in the air, some of them end up being sucked into the, uh, the servers by the, um, the cooling oh, fan. And, and they deposit on the boards and they make little short circuits. Wow. <laughs> yeah, wow. Isn't that amazing? That is. Well, quickly, I can look at that and I know that's what's going on. The, the other clue is the librarian had told me that um, they had had a, a, a rain leak and they had had uh, some uh, cleanup folks go in and pop the flooring where the, the rain leak was to mop up the fix, to mop up the water and uh, uh, clean up a little mold that was down there. And hmm. uh, after they had fixed the, the leak. And then oh, oh, two weeks later, they started losing, losing computers. Wow. Any more on here, John? Is there one more? That's it. All right. Listen, we're, we're running a little low on time. I want to get to a couple of important questions for you, Terry. Sure. First one, what, you know, you've had what, 30, 40 years uh, in this indoor air quality world. Um, what are you most proud of with respect to the work you've done over that 30, 40 years? Oh, uh, boy. What am I most proud of, huh? I, I, I think probably uh, the I'm most proud of uh, doing the work with the blower door testing big buildings and the Air Barrier Association of America uh, and ASTM to write uh, a blower door test standard that it takes into account the complexities uh, that that you run into when you test a big building, a commercial or an institutional or an industrial building. Uh, and that's uh, standard E, wait, what is it? 3850, no. <laughs> you, wait, you'd wait. think I could remember the test number, wouldn't you? 
I think so, but I may have it. No, I don't have it in the bio either, but we'll, we'll add it to the <laughs> Yeah. 5138. It's E5138. I was go. surprised. I, I, I was, I thought maybe you'd come up with this one, the moisture control guide. I, I, I just feel, feel like this is such an important document for people. Moisture control guidance for building design, construction, and maintenance. And I, I know it took forever to get this out. Can you tell people a little bit about how this came about? Um, that, that, well, this is, that's a, a, a book that, uh, the EPA decided they wanted to have produced and it started out, they wanted to do a design guide for, um, for all indoor air quality issues. Um, and they worked on that for quite a long time. And then they did a focus group and everybody in the focus group said, uh, just do the moisture stuff. We need the moisture stuff. Hmm. And so <laughs> it went from an IAQ guide to focused on moisture. And uh, the, you know, it was, it was a big effort. And the, you know, there are like three of us primary authors, but that, you know, the acknowledgements have to include Joe, Joe Stieberich and Betsy Pettit and John Straub and, uh, Bill Rose and Anton Tenwaldi and all those, all those folks who really brought clarity to moisture dynamics and buildings for us. Mm -hmm. And the intent of that guide was to almost be a, a primer on moisture dynamics uh, and to provide a checklist of if, if you want to design a building, build a building, uh, or maintain a building, so that you avoid moisture problems, these are the thing. These are the steps that you have to take. So you can almost use it as a checklist, to, a QA checklist to go through. And yeah, we've got all the pieces for the design, for the construction, and for the maintenance. And I, I've always taught people to use it, sort of. Um, you know, a lot of times this document wasn't around when that building was built, but you can still use it to determine how it would be built today if it was built right. And yeah. then kind of look at what you have and what you could have had and figure <laughs> out, is there, is, yeah, is there a, a bridge between the two? Can we somehow make it more like we could have had? It, it, uh, exactly. You can definitely use it as a, a, a forensic guide. The, what, what pieces are missing? In, in, that, in that case, I'm using that, that those lists as, what, what is this building missing that it really needs in order to avoid this moisture problem that we're seeing? All right, Terry, I think I've got a big question at the end here, but first let's go to our roundup. The roundup is brought to you by April Air, providing healthy humidity, ventilation and air purity solutions for new and existing homes. April Air, healthy air, healthy home at aprilaire.com. All right, let's go. Let's first get John Downey on here. And then I want to bring in an old friend of uh, Terry's and our show, uh, Pete Consigli. But John, first, I want to bring you in. I hope you're feeling okay, buddy. <laughs> well, I felt better, but I'm, I'm making it. So and uh, listening to Terry talk uh, kind of gave me some renewed energy. Good. <laughs> good, good, good. By the way, I've got a text here saying you're wearing a shirt plugging uh, a new book. Henry's here we book. go. I got them all here. Buildings uh -huh. Don't Lie, Terry. How's that? <laughs> Henry Gifford's book, yeah. Great job. Great job. I'll tell you, I... Uh, I think he did a wonderful job with that. All right, go ahead, John. So um, I understand we, we want to talk a little bit about indoor air 2021 real quick. Uh, Terry's one of your keynotes. Uh, go ahead. Well, actually, it's healthy. It's healthy buildings. 2021 that is actually going to be in January of 2022. 22, but <laughs> indoor air is in June. So we better get this healthy buildings done in June. We are in January. We will. You will uh, get yeah, it done. <laughs> we, uh, we have to, we don't have an option now. 
I, you know, I guess the first thing I wanted to say is Terry is one of the <laughs> featured speakers, uh, I believe, on day two of the conference. Uh, and we're really looking forward to that. And I know now why the person who, who um, um, really got us started on this and on, on seeking out Terry was Richard Shaughnessy and listening to, to Terry talk about his experiences with Richard. I can see why, you know, you guys have a lot of uh, experiences together historically and, uh, Shaughnessy uh, can't say enough about you. So I'm looking forward to your presentation and uh, it'll be one of the highlights uh, of the conference. Uh, the other thing I'd say about the conference, actually a couple things if you don't mind. Um, one is the theme of it is that it will be a research to practice conference. Yep. Uh, and, you know, and truly a research to practice and hopefully a practice to research conference. And that's why it's so important to have someone like Terry there, uh, as well as uh, Greg Whiteley is another one who has a lot of experience from both directions uh, that are uh, featured in the conference. We also have a lot of uh, presentations from a practitioner perspective. Some of them are kind of a combination of practice and research, how they work together. Uh, others are um, more oriented directly for practitioners, which is kind of an unusual thing in this particular conference, which is a traditionally it's a researcher conference. So uh, that's kind of a that's kind of a big deal. Uh, we feel at at Siri in particular because um, as an organization, the people that we serve primarily are practitioners, contractors and practitioners, people mm -hmm. involved in cleaning, restoration, remediation. Uh, so that's kind of a big deal. And then uh, the final thing is, I, I hope that uh, I can convince a few people that haven't yet uh, signed up to attend in person to consider it one more time. Uh, the, I, I'm amazed at how affordable the travel uh, costs are right now to Hawaii. They really mm -hmm. want to get people there. Yeah. They have been closed for far too long. And, uh, you know, the, you know, one of the questions I get, I'm sure I'll get, you know, so I'll ask, I'll answer it before I get it, Joe, is, are you really going to be live and in person in Hawaii? I sure and? as hell hope so. <laughs> <laughs> we hope you're still yeah, alive, Joel. Yeah. <laughs> We've gone to extraordinary lengths to, to make sure we do it. And uh, with, of course, with this latest um, uh, COVID variant, you know, it kind of has given us one final uh, challenge. But at, at this point, everything still looks good and is a go. The the people in Hawaii, as I just mentioned, are determined if at all pot, you know, while obviously health, safety and health is important, they're really uh, challenged to um, open up and, and, and enable their businesses to start running again because they've yeah. been uh, closed far more than anywhere else in the U.S., certainly not as much as some, some places like Australia. And, New Zealand, but uh, they've been uh, closed to a pretty exceptional extent. And they really are determined to get moving. But then, okay. and then the last thing is, if after everything I've said, you still don't want to take the chance of going to Hawaii, we do have a live stream that will be a part of the conference that people can uh, attend virtually. And uh, the live stream will, it's, it's one of the four tracks but it's the featured track and it will feature primarily research to practice presentations. And the, the word I was looking for before that I couldn't pull out was plenary. It will feature all six plenary presentations, including Terry's. All right, and Terry, what are you going to be talking about during your plenary presentation? <laughs> uh, I, I, I'm planning to talk about uh, the, the two-way bridge between research and uh, practice and how much um, how important it has been in my own life to have done the literature 
research, to read the research results and uh, figure out how they apply to my practice and to participate in some of the research and uh, have the, the, the hands-on experience of how that research happens. Um, and also how I have seen frequently the, the initial observations that lead to the research are made by practitioners. Uh, people mm -hmm. in the field um, trying to help people in buildings every day uh, see things that, and they, they don't have the resources to do a, a double blind study, but they, they notice stuff. They're looking in their scene and they're listening to the people in the buildings. And I've seen that feed back into the research over and over and over again, where the, the, uh, the scientific methods are applied by the researchers so that we really understand what's going on in the field. And, it, that, and when, when someone like me reads those studies, I, I can see how we can make interventions in the field in more effective ways than I would have been without that research. Okay. Hey, let me ask you real quick before I bring in Pete. Uh, first, Cliff, any final questions or thoughts from you? I know. It was just a really enjoyable uh, show. I loved it. Always enjoyed talking with Terry. Uh, Terry, real quick, before I bring Pete in, he can wrap things up for us on the ride up here. Give me the Terry Brennan future outlook for indoor air quality, the, the world of indoor air quality, um, maybe what will become more important that's already, you know, that we're not talking about now or uh, just how you th see things going in general. Well, it's, uh, it's more difficult in some ways uh, because the, our equipment and materials change so frequently, so fast for us now we 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 don't we don't have we it we you spend a lot of time just keeping up with, mm. with uh what's what's coming out and how is that actually gonna play out for us um so i i, I <laughs> and also i i'm counting on the young people to clean up the things that uh Joe Stebrick and me and Anton Tenwaldi have gotten wrong. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Well, somebody's got to clean up after. Uh, after <laughs> yeah. We spent last... a lot of our career cleaning up things that were the, the previous generations goofed up. And now uh, for you young folks, we're counting on you. <laughs> yeah. We need you. <laughs> yeah. um, if I, if I could interject. Uh, go ahead, John. That you mentioned that Terry because this Healthy Buildings Conference, it will feature more uh, student and young professional um, participants than any conference that has come before. I mean, it's like double what is typical of the, of the Healthy Buildings Conferences. It's the, the, the people at ISIAC have been uh, pretty amazed at the, uh, uh, I, and I, I don't know, maybe, I don't know, young people like to go to Hawaii. I don't know. But <laughs> that might have something. So do old people. <laughs> I, yeah, big number, big number of, uh, of uh, grad students and young professionals will be there. So all those people, right. Terry, you're going to have a captive audience for your, <laughs> your talk to them. Well, Terry, the other thing, I, I, was, I don't want to leave without having at least some word from you on how COVID has changed the indoor air quality world. Then we're going to go over to uh, Pete and Sigley. Um, it's, COVID has changed the indoor air quality world in, in uh, I think, in some big ways. And at the heart of that is that COVID has it's become clear to me, COVID is largely an indoor air issue. Mm -hmm. this is, it's a building related issue or a vehicle related issue. This is where the exposures actually occur. There are very few exposures happening in outdoors. So, so it, it highlights in my mind, um, thinking about the quality of the indoor air. Yeah, I don't, I don't think we're ever going back to a time when people didn't 
recognize and, and understand the importance of indoor air? Yeah, yeah, I don't think so. Um, and and uh, it also, uh, for me, has highlighted uh, the issues of uh, weaknesses in our worldwide uh, and our national public health uh, organizations. We, we, Great point. We, we have a lot of work to do there. Great point. All right, Pete Consigli, the restoration industry global watchdog, good friend of the show, and of course of Terry. Final thoughts, Pete. Well, listen, the, Terry's wearing the shirt that buildings don't lie, and that's because Terry Brennan don't lie either. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you, sir. Although, although I, I wasn't. When was Steve Rick ever wrong? Now, did Steve Rick ever get anything wrong? Don't, don't answer that. <laughs> Yeah, when growing actually, up, we, we, used to, hey, Terry, we used to call that a white lie when I was growing up. Go ahead. <laughs> Joe, Joe has always in, uh, struck me as someone more honest than most about when he's gotten things wrong. <laughs> yeah, he's he's admitted to it, Pete. Yeah. Absolutely. <laughs> yeah, no, I, I, I agree with that. He, uh, he, he, he mans up. That's one good thing we all love about Joe. Uh, anyway, you know, I noticed uh, Linda Whitty, Whit, uh, Wigington was on the call most because she must have had a log off. And, uh, you know, Linda started the ACI, for the Affordable Comfort Conference. She was at the first very summer camp, just like Terry was. Uh, of course, uh, Jason Printable from Hawaii is on, my old buddy. He's come to a couple summer camps. <laughs> and uh, Win and Win White, he's been to a number of summer camps. And, uh, you know, uh, so Terry, the, Terry, was one of the that's when I first met Terry uh it was at the first summer camp so a couple little summer camp things about Terry number one his wife is is an amazing gourmet cook and uh, uh one year I uh, at the at the like the Friday night uh before you know Joe has a pretty big deal a lot of people come in Friday night you know and he does a little he he makes his what he calls his uh beaver stew uh you, you know with that uh I guess his, I think his mom taught him how to make a check dish. And um, anyway, uh, before I got to that, Terry's wife came and for about a dozen of us made just an amazing meal in Betsy's dining room kitchen. That was really great. Um, the other thing is, uh, in one of the years when we started doing desserts, we didn't do desserts at summer camp for the longest time. And 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 about year eight or nine or ten. Terry Weston, who's now retired from DuPont, she, she basically, you know, what's this thing with the desserts? No desserts. She said, well, you know, we, we don't want anybody, who, you know, holding out to eat the real summer camp food for the desserts. So Steve Rick says, look, uh, you know, you want a dessert, bring it yourself. Well, that was a really bad thing to tell that Terry, not <laughs> Terry Weston, because you don't ever back the tie vets up into a corner. So the one day her and all her tie vets, they come with about 15 different pies from some local shops. That was the beginning of the Tuesday night fancy desserts, which eventually became cannolis from Modern. There's two famous cannoli places in Boston that fight over who makes the best cannolis, Mike and Modern. But Modern has a local branch in the suburbs close to, to Westford. So we started doing that. One year, Terry sponsored the cannolis, which was really, really nice. And everybody loves those little mini cannolis that they bring. Yeah. Now, now here's a really good Henry Gifford story. Now, first of all, if anybody, if there was a, if there was some kind of a contest for the person who sells the most Henry Gifford books and Joe Stebrick books, I, I, I'd be I'd be there in the running to maybe win the gold prize in that category. But uh, <laughs> so what? So one year, you know, Henry was there at some, at the first summer camp too, and and Henry is so funny. So he he, he introduces himself as an old boiler mechanic, right? Yeah. Okay. Yep. Yeah, like yep. Terry's just Terry's just uh, some guy who knows stuff too. That's a, that's how we actually Terry. That's how you introduced yourself the first year at summer camp. You stood up and we all went around because there weren't that many people in those days. Well, I'm just a guy who knows stuff. Anyway, okay. <laughs> so what happens? What happens with Henry? We're standing in the kitchen, Joe's kitchen, one of the days of the summer camp, uh, like in the weekend before, and there's a problem with the hot water, and there's no hot water, and so Henry's standing on the second floor. Somebody's complaining on the top floor of the house is no hot water. And the, bo the boiler for the hot water is in the basement. So Henry says, flush the toilet. So somebody flushes the toilet and Henry goes, well, this is the part you need to fix the hot water heater. 
He diagnosed it while he's standing on the second floor, listing someone flushed the toilet with no water on the top floor and the boiler in the bottom floor. The plumber was there. He got the part. And he goes, how'd you do that? I don't know. He's just an old boiler mechanic. So, so <laughs> guys, you know, that, that was it. I, I had a found respect for Henry after that, you know, from there on. And when he wrote his book about buildings on lie, it's really a book written in real layman's terms. It's really a, fab a fabulous book. Anyone hasn't checked it out, they ought to look into it. Yep. Anyway, um, you know, Terry, uh, there's a lot of us guys now who are kind of retired, if you would. But something tells me we're just going to be finding something to do, really. And until we're out there and have no choice to be munching the grass out in the pasture somewhere, you know, the younger generation <laughs> keeps pushing us and wants to get us out there. We're kind of walking at our own pace. But uh, it is nice to hear John talk about a lot of the young people will be coming to Hawaii. And, of course, um, you know, our winter break event, which will be right after the Hawaii event, uh, uh, we got a, an audience, uh, you know, with the relationship with John Isaacs and Brenda Diojo podcast to bring that next generation of people in who really need to, you know, take the reins from a lot of the retiring baby boomers. Um, the only final thing that I want to say, Joe, and I noticed Downey turned off his video, but he doesn't really have a cold. He he's still he's he's been crying so much. And it affects his voice <laughs> and his beating that happened at the big house a few weeks ago. And uh, everybody should keep in mind the date Monday, January 10th, because that's the date of the National College Championship football game. And all of Buckeye Nation is rooting for two SEC teams. Who would have ever, ever thought that? Because yep. I can only imagine what it's going to be like in in the Hadani's house and Chuck Biolin, who's already been on social media commiserating about the whooping that the Bucks took. If these two, well, the team from up north, we can't even mention a the name. They try to get Urban Meyer to do it. He won't even say the name. And of course, <laughs> the other team in the state of OHIO, which is how they do it, that begins with a C that's not named Columbus. Because if these two teams, ever get past the dogs and the tide who knows it's just it's a whole new world but Cliff's good buddy Harry Bell just likes to say this anytime the Big Ten and these uh uh, uh the, the SEC guys get too little uppity pay attention to this radio Joe of all the college teams in the NCCA the University of Pittsburgh Panthers have more total championships than any other team, which includes all sports, not just the big ones. So don't ever right. count out. Don't <laughs> ever count out the big Panthers. Anyway, uh, I don't buy get a little it. bit. Of, and Downey, I, I don't love buy you. that for a second. It's yeah, true, man. Know, it's you true. See that clip? He thinks Harry's <laughs> making that up. That he, no, sir. You're going to be getting a link from Harry. With truth all of that be, information. Truth but check no, with Siri beyond on the Big Ten, there is no college. No, athletic. no. Check with Siri. <laughs> check with Alexa. Check with whoever you want to check with. The Pitt Panthers are, are the guys in that particular area. But oh, anyway, boy. hey, look, it was uh, it was really terrific. Terry, I uh, enjoyed listening to you. And uh, I've always appreciated all the work you've done. And I'm sure I'll be running into you somewhere along the way. And uh, anyway, you guys enjoy Hawaii. No, Jason. Uh, Jason privately kind of want to know if I'd be in Hawaii. Unfortunately, I won't be in Hawaii. I got too much going on. And, and Downey, there's no excuse for jet lag. I know you're only home one day, and then I'll be seeing you coming down to Deerfield Beach for the winter break. Be there bright-eyed and bushy-tailed. And uh, I'll miss not being able to see Sarah come down. But, of course, your daughter Shannon will be there. I love her, too. And, uh, anyway, you guys have a good time in Hawaii. Uh, hopefully have a great conference. And, and there's some of you on the call and others, you know, we'll see you all down there for the winter break. Z-Man and Radio Joe on Friday are going to be doing a live stream. Uh, happenings from Deerfield Beach and winter break. Uh, undecided who's going to be on the call, but we'll figure it out down there when we're down there. So looking forward to seeing you all. I'll turn it back to you, Radio Joe. Thank you, Pete. And before we go, Terry, final thoughts before we wrap it up for the day. Um, be safe. Be safe. Yep. I hear you. Thank you so much, Terry. It's always great to have you. Uh, like the new style, by the way, looking good. Uh, <laughs> this is my COVID cut. <laughs> got the COVID style going there. <laughs> Cliff, any final thoughts from you? 
No, I'm good. Thanks, so. All right. I want to thank Mr. Terry Brennan. It's always great to talk to you, Terry. Um, you know, you're a legend in the in the indoor air quality world, and uh, you've you've contributed so much to the industry over the years. I just want to give you my personal thanks for. Um, you know, I still use I still use the the uh, building air quality guide that came out in the 90s. It, it's it's timeless. And uh, I think you've been involved with so many things people didn't realize it. And uh, I just wanted to bring it out. And thank you once again for joining us. And I want to thank my co-host, the Z-Man, Cliff Zlotnick, of course. Uh, John, you got to have faith at the controls. Uh, of course, the Restoration Industry Global Watchdog and uh, John Donnie at Siri, the Cleaning Industry Research Institute. Got to join Siri if you're not a member. Important in that research to practice world. We're going to be taking a little time off for the holidays. We'll be back on uh, January 7th with the next live edition of IAQ Radio Plus. For IAQ Radio, I'm Spike Reel saying thanks for listening. 